Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by Cheshire Impact, on a mission to help people maximize their use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. I hit the button and we get started. I am excited for this one. My guest is so far away, uh, <laughs> geographically speaking, but we are so close in terms of uh, marketing automation. She is a wizard. She is experienced with the world of marketing automation, but not just that. She is very much an international marketing leader. These are all clues for people. Like, who, who is he talking to? International marketing leader, entrepreneur, Marketing Automation Strategist. We are going to geek out on MA today. Um, certified Pardot Consultant, but also part of the Pardot Advisory Board at Salesforce Pardot. Pardot Practice Lead at Destined, live from Australia, Tammy Begley. Welcome to the show. Hey, Casey. Thank you so much. And yeah, it seems like we're so far away. But as you say, I think today in today's world, um, it's actually been such a blessing for people like myself to have something like COVID because it gets to, means I get to interact with someone like you um, more easily. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm really excited to be on your show. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. I'm impressed with the Wi-Fi and the the fiber optics running under the ocean or whatever, however the hell the signal is going back and forth. I'm impressed with it. I'm impressed with you. So what I want to do is pass you this thing. It's kind of heavy, but uh, I'm going to throw it all the way to your side of the earth. Ugh. Okay, here we go. Thor's hammer. You got it? Okay, I hope uh, so. There you go. You got it. Okay, take Thank Thor's you. hammer, smash some kind of marketing myth, bogus strategy, misconception. Just set the record straight once and for all. Oh, so the biggest one for me, Casey, is that um, because I work with clients implementing marketing automation all the time is I often feel amazed at how they think that they've bought a marketing automation tool and now this is their silver bullet and it's going to answer all their marketing automation requirements. Plus, it's actually going to make them even better at marketing just by implementing or putting the system in and switching it on. Um and then they're they're really surprised when you sort of say, well, you know, it's it's a bit like buying a house, right? Or, or building a house. You got the found foundations, and we're going to put up some some sort of pillars and some su support structures, and then you still need to put on the cladding, decorate the house, and actually right. put things in place for them to, you know, for your silver bullet to actually start working for you. Yeah, uh, all see, all those things they don't happen. They don't all magically happen. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah. It's like you don't just put on the put it put put part on in and go on and then all these magical things happen. Yeah, and to your point, you be some suddenly become better at marketing and your marketing strategy that didn't exist now suddenly exists. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And then you're expecting all these miracles on day one. It's like mm, no, <laughs> we've got a lot uh, of work to do together. <laughs> well, why why do we think that? Why, where does that misconception that misbelief come from? Well, it's probably, you know, stems back to they've um, maybe in the demonstration phase of, of seeing a tool like this, they've seen all these amazing things happen. And, you know, we always need to remember and be realistic that when we're watching a demo of something, we're seeing a Rolls Royce. Um, and this particular environment has had lots of work put into it to make it look and do um, what customers wanted to do. So, you know, from that side of things, I think, um, you know, th there's also maybe people who just you know, going into it quite blindly and, and they're being told, well, um, the way of the world today is you need a marketing automation platform or you can't do marketing, right? And so they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll get a platform, we'll get a system and we'll put it in and then then, we, then we're, we're there. Um, so I think, you know, it's just perceptions, um, maybe going into it a little bit uneducated um, or not misinformed. It's probably a better word. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, as I say, you know, you get blown away by these, um, great demo videos and 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 the way that it's positioned to you that you think oh you know when I get it that's what it's going to look like and we're going to just plug it in and and off we go. Yeah, it almost never does it. Any kind of tool provide you a strategy. It provide it may open doors to new strategies you didn't have the ability to do or you didn't have the resources to to touch like. The idea of programmatically nurturing people in different segments and stuff, you could do that manually, 
you could do that yeah. manually on Outlook, but it might take you too long that you wouldn't be able to hire someone full time just to do all those emails. So it may open those doors, but it doesn't necessarily tell you, you know, like what to say. It's like sometimes people they learn, I learned how to send an email. Like, cool, what are you going to send? I have no idea. <laughs> and that's one of the biggest things we find is, um, you know, the customers now get the tools, they learn how to use it, and then they go, ah, what content should I be using? You know, where, what should we be writing? Where, where should this be coming from? And, you know, how do we know what to write? And so the content piece becomes like this big beast for them because they think, oh, we've never actually focused on content um, and now we, we sort of being forced to because we've got the system and it can do all these great things. Um, how do we make it work? Yeah. Um, which is, I guess, I guess, you know, one of the things we, we like to do, and it, it is, it is normally an optional item for a lot of our customers that we work with, but we always, we run a, what we call a tactical planning day, um, with a client before they even start using Pardot, because a lot of them say, well, I've got this marketing automation tool, now what? And so, yeah. you know, a lot of them haven't thought of that strategy of, oh, how do I take my marketing strategy or my marketing plan and now align it and bring it together so that um, the two can work um, and work for me? So so we do, um, it's a full day, it's a six hours, um, and it's, it's a really awesome session where we talk about things like custom experience. We talk about things like content and where content is on different parts of um, people's buying journey. And we talk about things like, well, what are you going to be doing to entice people into your world when you've got them? You know, what sort of nurturing things would you think about using? How are you going to grow your existing customer base? And how are you going to support sales in closing more stuff? So, you know, it's a full day but sometimes people haven't even had the chance to just sit down and unpack all of that stuff yeah to then build the strategy to then start building it inside the platform that's so powerful um you know first question i have for you is is a full day six hours in australia because if so sign me up i'm <laughs> i'm moving i know i know your borders are closed for covid but like sneak me in that sounds yeah. great well, I say a full day. It's, it's uh, our days I'm in, just in Australia are an eight hour. <laughs> but um, but I find that customers just generally can't. Um, oh. that, that's just a six hour day is a hectic day, right? Totally. What you're talking about there, you could easily do a week on because there it, yeah. it's some intense conversation. People's brains are going to be smoking by the end of it, especially if you're talking them through the things you're talking about, the customer experience, the content, and then the fact that there's a journey going on with stages and how to support yeah. sales and how to entice people. How do you start that whole day off? Is there some questions that you ask like right at the very beginning? <laughs> well, the, the questions are, what do you, what are your objectives at the end of the session? What do you want to get out of um, the end of the session? So that's, um, that's the the first bit that we cover off. And it's that's great. a good one. And the smart yeah. and the, the smarter the experienced people will have some objectives. And then the people that are new to it, which I've been one at one point are like, I don't even know what to ask you to tell to teach me. <laughs> well, those people often just go, um, we just want to know how Pardot works. Um, right. cause actually quite often a lot of those people that come into those sessions haven't been part of the buying cycle. Mm, so they, they, some so of true. them have never seen Pardot. Yeah. And so uh, one of the first things we do is um, once we once we do our icebreaker questions, which are the other ones, like how do you put an uh, elephant in the fridge? How do you oh. put a giraffe in the fridge? I don't know if you've heard those questions. No, tell, tell me, is that just the question? How do you put, and you, you ask that question and you. Well, it's actually a, a series of questions and um, I'm just going to try and get them up so that I can remember them. Yeah, pull right up. Do you want to ask, ask me those questions? And then yeah, you, yeah, you let's, let's do it. And uh, the, the interesting thing is this, this, um, these questions were put together by, um, gosh, and I might be misrepresented, but I, I think it's a, a group like Accenture and it was really a way to start to sort of test, um, people's headspace what, what like the oh way we're thinking the way we think and um when they ask the same questions to a bunch of six-year-olds the uh -oh. six-year-olds just nailed it right really? <laughs> yeah so it's just and, and we're, what we really try to get to at the end of those kind of icebreaker questions is saying to everyone today you know you need to start thinking um out of the box mm. you know you need to stop stop pre having preconceived ideas around what you think um, because the way you're going to find yourself being successful is if you can break down some of those boundaries and, oh and think differently and, and then also start to make um, like, you know, um, 
connections between things because not mm -hmm. everything sits as a singular singular kind of item. So the questions are um, first first of all is how do you put a giraffe in the fridge? Okay, and so is this going to basically compare my IQ to that of a sixth grader? So okay, <laughs> let's get going. Let's so, go for it. How do I put a giraffe in a fridge? Yeah. It is just open ended like that, so I can do anything I want that's to the it. giraffe. Do they that's have to stay you alive? Can, you can tell me anything you think of how you would get that giraffe into the fridge. And I've heard some pretty gruesome things over the R years. Right. And then do you do you like profile your 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 clients? I'm like, <laughs> okay, these people killed the giraffe. We gotta charge. <laughs> yeah. Um, I Be was careful thinking, of them. <laughs> yeah, there's like either the I could chop them up into fillets. You know what? I I would say it's a walk in fridge. And I'm putting some fresh, I'm opening the door and I'm putting some fresh leaves. Kind of like, almost like we're putting little hearts, Hershey kisses along the way to the, to the bedroom or something. Little leaves <laughs> along the way. Come giraffe to my, my frozen fridge. Please freezer. enter my, my walk-in yes. fridge. Well, the, the, the question, is, the answer to that question is you literally open the door of the fridge and you put the giraffe inside and you close the door. And the, the, the reason being is, did you in your mind think of your fridge, maybe in your kitchen thinking, hmm, how would I ever get a giraffe into that yeah. size fridge? Yeah. And so that's, the, that's the, the, the lesson there, right? We all kind of, we have a, a vision of a fridge, which is in our kitchen usually. And we go, oh, how would I put a giraffe in there? But, but we didn't tell you the size of the fridge. We didn't right. say, or the you know, giraffe. It, it's, that's it. So it's yeah. kind of open the door, put it in and close the door. So, so the follow-up question. Do I get half credit? Yeah. Because like I yeah, expanded the size of my <laughs> fridge, but you're right. I still thought big giraffe, not one of those cute little Sophia squeezy toys. You know? <laughs> That's yeah. true. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and putting the, and, and we say fillet, but put cutting it up in and putting it in as fillets um, right. yeah. is, is, is the usual answer I get. Yeah, you just cut it up and then you put it in the fridge. <laughs> 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 It's just it just shows you as adults, um, we've also been conditioned to to thinking in certain ways. Can you um, eat giraffe? I don't think so. It sounds I'm like South it'd be Africa. A, a bad thing. Like you, no. you end up on some website of like people that you know. Yeah, I, I am originally South African, and um, I've I don't think I've ever seen giraffe on a menu, and I might be completely wrong. But I, as a person, I would I would probably never ever entertain. I know they, they're like friendly, right? I mean, it's like, it's like a horse with spots and a cool neck. Um, we're <laughs> yeah. going to find out about this, this, you growing up in South Africa in a little bit, but okay, let's keep yeah. going with the, the test. Uh, I kind of passed the first, we got half credit. What's the next question? That's right. So the next one is how do you put an elephant into the fridge? Cool. And so now that I've been trained, I, I guess the, the answer now is like, I'll pick it up. I open the door and I put it in. Is that? Did I pass? Well, you'd almost, you almost passed ah. because the giraffe's in the fridge. So we've got oh. to take the giraffe out. So you open the door, we take the giraffe out, we put the elephant in and then we close the fridge. Why do I have to take the giraffe out? What if it was a tiny giraffe? Yeah. And, and again, I guess it's your perception. So sure. we, we, we were, um, we thinking of the, the life size type of animal in this case. Um, but we, we, we're not, pre, we're not having a preconception of how big the fridge is. Um, True. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the thinking. And then the, the, the third question, and there's only four, um, is the king of the jungle is holding a meeting for all the animals. One of them is not there. Which one? King of the jungle. This is good. Okay. And everyone listening, ponder this with me. King of the jungle is holding a meeting with, with all the animals. Could you say it one more time? Is it yep. The king of the jungle is holding a meeting with all the animals. One of them is not there. Which one? One of them is not there. Gosh, gosh, I should have called it a day at the first. That's a really, um, I guess if I had imagine to imagine starting a workshop being asked all these crazy questions, you'd be a bit fearful, right? Yeah, I know. But I, I like the first ones because even if the right or wrong answer, you're just getting people to expand their minds. And now I'm trying to figure out if this is one of those questions where I should be expanding my mind or not. But um, king of the jungle. And we didn't say the lion. Or we didn't call out who the actual king of the jungle is. Yeah, um, yeah. All the animals, one is not there. Who's not there? Um, uh, the human, the humans are not there. So, so the, the elephant's not there. It's in the fridge. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so there, you know, that whole linking oh things my and gosh. questions together. Um, I love yeah, that. And, and as, as I said to you, 
a bunch of six-year-olds. Because it's in the fridge. This, right? Yeah. That they are going, yeah, but you just told me that you put the elephant in the fridge and he's part of the jungle and he's the, he's not there. Yeah. I was getting all then, metaphysical. Like, ooh, maybe <laughs> what being? Are, are crocodiles not animals? Like, who's not there? Oh, my gosh. And it's like, uh, dummy, the last question, you just literally put the yeah. elephant in the fridge. Yeah, and if you go on the same lines, um, then the last question is, yes. you're standing on a bank of an alligator infested river and you have to get to the other side. What do you do? You're standing on the bank of an alligator infested river. You got to get to the other side. What do you do? Immediately now, it's almost like these these questions are a great trick because like, you do the first one, they're like, oh, gotcha. You do the second one, they remind you about the first one. So now that you've reminded me several times about the previous questions, I feel like I need to take the elephant out of the fridge, sacrifice him in the river, and then sneak across. But um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll say that's my answer. Final so, yeah, answer. And, and, and the answer is that you actually you can swim across because all the alligators are attending the meeting. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so that that um. Oh, I failed. Question, I should go back to elementary school. Well, this particular question checks how quickly you learn, right? So, um, if you answered yeah. number four correctly, which you know we told you the answer, then <laughs> oh, okay, let me link the questions and be very simplistic. But but the overall thing is, and I think the 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 key message that we try and convey in this exercise is, you got to keep it think it's simple. Don't get too complex in your thinking yeah. up front um, because, you know, and also think differently. So it's, it's really a great way to start a session like that and just open up the playing fields, put everybody on an even playing field and say, right, we're here today because we're going to try and help you put that silver bullet into place. But it's not going to be as we set the system up and running. It is going to be a gradual process. And the more simplistically you think, yeah. And the less complex you can be in the beginning, the more you're going to get out of it. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the, where we start. Wow. I, see, Straight you into know a demo. These are great. They're just mild enough that I don't feel too much like an idiot, but they're just fun and challenging and kind of witty and quirky that I, I can see after doing those questions, I'm like, cool, I, I surrender, teach me. <laughs> and like if, as a consultant, then people are ready to listen they're not challenging you on, well, I disagree with your approach to this marketing strategy or this thing. Or blah, blah, blah. Okay. Let's take a, take a step back or I'm going to go get the alligators. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> We're going to oh, bring them that's, on. <laughs> that's great. So I feel like now I'm ready to learn from you on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And then, then I quickly jump into a part of demo. So then, then I look like I'm, I'm even, you know, more sharp because now I'm going to show you all the concepts and things that you can think about and that what we're going to explore and unpack um, during that course of the six hours. The beauty is, I must say, with um, COVID and the fact that I'm in Melbourne and we're still in lockdown, we've been in lockdown, second wave lockdown for 12 weeks, Jeez. is we actually run these um, as two, three two-hour sessions across mm. a couple of days, which just nice chunks, sort of breaks up nicely, gives people time to let that juices flow and process overnight and then they come back the next day with some great questions and some great concepts and yeah so it's um it's it's a really good way i i i'll say that um covid for me has forced us to do a lot of the stuff that we might have done face to face previously virtually yeah. and i feel like we've every single tactical planning session i've run virtually and i've probably done about 5 um over the last couple months have had a much better outcome because what I also do is I get people to engage with me on the, on, on the, on the chats. Right. And so I get all their feedback and they, they, they give me everything and we can put it into a document. And now suddenly, you know, at the end of it, we've got a, we've got a little working document that we can start to, to unpack as well. Oh, tell me about that. So is everyone on like a Google doc and you're all writing notes or how do you, well, uh, sounds like good. Yeah, we, yeah, and so we use um we we're on Google, but we use Jamboard a lot. Jamboard. And we do Jamboard sessions. So um I don't know if it's a bit of a whiteboard. It's Google's whiteboard if you haven't heard about it. Um, where you use sticky notes and 
as what I what I tend to do is because not all customers are on Google, and so for them to get onto it, they'd have to log in. But what I tend to do is get them to give me the information via the chat on the Google Hangouts, and then I just copy and paste it into into sticky sticky notes, and then that starts to create um, some documentation. Plus, we just have a slide deck, right? And the slide deck's got some spaces for um, for content, so anything oh. that's relevant to that and we pop that in and um and there you go like without having to sit after the fact and write out you know big strategy documents we're doing it on the on the fly wow 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 that's cool like one of the things i'm always searching for is you know we a lot of people get zoom fatigued and i love the fact that you split up a six hour thing into three separate ones and you're encouraging the engagement. It's so important. And this, the concept of Jamboard, really cool. I don't think I've ever used it. Do you have like a stylus you're using virtually with that? Or are you just yeah, dragging so you, and dropping stuff? So you can write, you can write, um, you can start, you can write, you can also type text onto the Jamboard. You can use sticky notes. I find, I find the writing a bit difficult because I don't use a mouse and yeah. I find writing with my, my app, my MacBook mouse is, yeah, and I'm left-handed, so I'm probably, you know, I've oh, got no. a, I know I've got one of those issues to deal with too. So, um, yeah, but it, generally it's just more around taking the collaboration and then popping it on um, via a text box or, or a sticky note. So are people just dropping cool stuff in there during the meeting or different thoughts and ideas and... Yes, yeah, so it's the way we the way we chunk it down is um, into different sections, and then when we're dealing with that section, we've got little activities that we run, you know, to 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 get people to unpack certain things, um, and then and then through those activities, they then wow. give us, and it's it's awesome. I, and the other thing is is um, it's not actually only the marketing team that we ask to come to these sessions. We ask them, we ask them to involve sales. We ask them to involve service. Anyone who's sort of more frontline, who's customer facing, because often I find, um, and I, I don't know in the US if this is the case, uh, Pardot's been built to, to um, you know, bring sales and marketing closer together. And um, they, they, they still don't kind of communicate and, and come together so starting a project like this where where you you bring all those people in and let them give you and let marketing learn because sometimes the marketing te teams come back to me and go wow awesome session like we didn't even know this and we didn't know that and it's like yeah you know how can you support service through certain things that you can automate how can you help sales close deals by automating certain things or making you know, nice case studies, really beautifully written case study type of emails available or that kind of stuff um, so that they can just utilize them and, and stop them from having to become these sales cowboys who create their own beautiful marketing emails that you know, <laughs> right. your, your logo has been stretched out and, you know, you're like, oh, how did that get past? Oh, so, yeah. It's, it's a really valuable session. Um, and as I say, we usually allow it to be an optional, but I often say to my customers, if there's one item that I think you should try and get budget to add into your whole experience is let's go with this one because it really will help set the scene for how do we then start that process of building you your silver bullets to get you a couple of wins um, on the board straight away and get yeah. people excited. Yeah, that excitement is important so that they get some momentum behind them, marketing gets some support from sales. It's so smart that you're having everyone that's on the revenue team, right? We talk about it online all the time, having everyone on the revenue team in that room or that virtual room so they hear the crosstalk. You know, it's like, ah, oh, sales does that? Or yeah. Sales answers this question and they answer it like this? Oh, dear God. Like, Let's make a video and tell everyone the right answer first before they ever get to sales. Or that way it can help sales not have to answer that question. And sales is like, yeah. I didn't realize you did all these things for me. And oh, yeah. that's it. it's so powerful. I could see that being, you know, it's kind of funny is like, I'm sure the challenge, you have this challenge too, maybe is we want that to happen. We want to get them all in the room. And so it's trying to figure out what kind of workshop do I have to, call this to, to get sales get and them. marketing to be in the same room so they just shut up for a second and like listen to each other you know yeah well they often say to me at the end of it Do you know we would never have put something like that we would have never run something like that internally interesting but, yeah wow it's kind of you know it's opened our eyes up to um 
you know, one of the activities we might do is sort of well, how if you were a customer, how would you rate yourself from, you know, rate the business um, on a scale of one to 10? And why did you give yourself that score? What do you yeah. do really, really well? And what do you what do you need? I don't say what do you do badly, but what's the opportunity for improvement is mm -hmm. the why didn't you give yourself a score of 10? And it's, it's just amazing that those opportunity pieces that come up that marketing would never, ever have been aware of. But because they've now got people from different areas all contributing, it's like, okay, you know, we were going to focus on this, but actually this little section here seems to be way, it's come up again and again and again, and it's come from sales, it's come from service, it's come from any, you know, so that that is, and so it can also help start to set priorities and almost change sort of focus and, you know, where are we going to start? Yeah, I love that virtual board. Would you normally have people doing stickies if you're there in person? Yeah, so the whole sort of uh, wow. in in person thing is, you know, butch. I don't know if you call it butcher paper, which is big white sheets of paper, and we stick it all over. What do you the call walls. it? Butcher paper. Butcher paper. <laughs> I, and and again, this is an Australian term because in South Africa we would have called it flip chart paper. Yeah. Yeah. Flip charts. Yes. In Australia, but, um, you call this you call that butcher paper. I mean, I'm looking at butcher paper now. You're right. It's like this long sheet of paper, and you can wrap meats in it and stuff. <laughs> I guess, or you yeah. could write your marketing plan. That's it. And then you, and then you'd give the customer back all these big sheets of paper and, you know, we'd use stickies and stuff like that and group things. And, and then we give it back yeah. to the customer at the end. And so, so now that's why I said, you, yeah, I feel like the virtual sessions are awesome. They get a beautiful slide deck um, yeah. with all the different sections. And then I've just transposed everything. I've added the jam board in to that. And so suddenly they've got this, this silver bullet to getting their marketing automation platform in place. You got some really valuable butcher paper there. You know, it's funny when I uh, Google, it's like butcher paper near me. And sure enough, there's three locations near me where I can get it. <laughs> so Google understood what I was looking for. Australian yeah. in New Hampshire. It, it knew. Did it give you a stationary shop or did it give you a butcher yeah, shop? Yeah. It gave me, um, uh, well, it gave me Home Depot, which is interesting. Um, it gave me Staples, which is our like office store. Yes. Give me the Alpine Butcher. Okay, so it's not perfect, but it gave me an actual <laughs> butcher, Home Depot, which probably has everything, and then Staples, yeah. which is the real yeah. reason. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Well, I, where did you learn this? Maybe we'll get. Oh, hold on to that. One. I, we'll ask you when we get to like you and your history where you learned this, because this is really great presentation and engagement ideas, and I, I can see you're you're challenging them, you're keeping them interested, you're show, you're getting them excited, and then you're talking through the marketing strategies. Do you remember? the uh, first time you ever saw marketing automation or Pardot or any of those tools? Yep. Yep. Take I, me back. Yeah, <laughs> was that was an, um, and so again, like I often think, um, so I, I moved to Australia in 2011. Okay. And I'd never heard of it while I was in a marketing role in South Africa. Um, in fact, exactly how you explained earlier, I was putting pretty emails together and sending them out of Outlook, um, you know, the, the, back in the day, came over to Australia and got myself a job um, at, a, at a fairly large global company, but I was in an Australian um, only division yeah. and yeah. was using, you know, met what was then exact target and um, sort of started to try and use exact target. And, you know, I just, it was just the wrong fit for our business. We were mm -hmm. a B2B it was quite complex in trying to get the emails out and it was very frustrating because you know, you'd put these beautiful emails together and then you'd send them the test version and they'd look nothing like what they were in the back end. And I thought, oh no, I need something more simplistic and sort of easy yeah. to use and intuitive. Um, I was I was a solo marketer in this huge division. I mean, yeah, that, that was a whole other ball game. I had to really coach them and, and teach them the, how important marketing was and how you know, you don't just create your own little brochures on a PDF document um, in-house and, you know, getting them properly designed and having a brand strategy and having you know, all those things in place is a really good start. Yeah. But at the same time, looking for that um, simplistic tool, I, I've, I came across Pardot. And in those days, it still wasn't part of Sales Cloud or Salesforce. Right. So, um, yeah. And when I saw the demo of it, in my mind, I said to myself, in the next five years, if a company does not have a marketing automation tool in place of some sort, I actually don't think 
they're going to have a very successful marketing uh, like approach and and that was in 2012 you know so and I what I said to at that stage I was like I actually want to immerse myself in this because I don't think that a traditional marketer that came out of uni you know 20 years ago is going to be the same thing anymore. Yeah. It's, it, you know, at that stage, there was a digital marketer and there was a marketer and there was kind of, but I, I feel like as a marketer this day, you are both. You got to be. You have yeah. to be both. Yeah. And that was, the, so that in 2012, I was going, the future of marketing is going to look like this. Mm -hmm. um, you will have to be a digital marketer and a, what do you call it? Traditional marketer all in one. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have those skill sets, you're going to find it really hard to survive in, in the future and in yeah. the new world. Yeah. Yeah. You need both. And then same thing with marketing automation. You need to have those concepts. You can't just be doing the batch and blast anymore. You're going to get out, you're, you're getting out past and outdated from the folks doing nurturing and segmentation and all that. What do you see? What comes around the bend? Is there anything that in the future that you're excited about with marketing automation? Um, what do you see the changes? You have to read a, you were doing some predictions five years ago. What what do the next yeah. five years look like? So so um, the word marketing ops, yeah, is is making you know. I was very fortunate before I three years ago before I left and and came onto the consulting side. I was with the same company, but we'd evolved uh, quite dramatically from a decentralized marketing function to a more centralized marketing function. Um, and the team, we had a marketing ops team, right? So this is nearly th yeah, three years, four years ago that a company in Australia had that concept of, yeah, you need a marketing ops team to drive technology, to make sure that things are aligned, to be there, to check and to make sure, you know, it, it, so, sorry, and I'm rambling here. And no, I'm no, no. My words, but, sure. but I, I feel like marketing ops, which I, I can, I'm reading so much about, and there seems to be quite a lot of content coming out of the US around this. And a lot of people that I follow are all sort of saying the same things is it's growing. But at the moment, I think it's so undervalued. Um, and a lot of the articles I'm reading are sort of, you know, you, you will need marketing ops and they are going to be such a value that you, you don't, that you're not going to go and pay them some, this tiny wage. They're actually going to be a fundamental part of, um, the company. Mm -hmm. In fact, in fact, and I'm going to say this so loosely is like a CMO versus a marketing ops person. I, I almost think a marketing ops person is going to be critical to getting, the actual whole marketing, right? Oh yeah. Because if your systems aren't aligned and your stack is not correct, you can be doing anything and everything, but not actually getting the right return of your yeah. efforts. And so, yeah, my prediction is that um, marketing ops is the future and what those teams look like, you know, I don't know, but I, I, I feel like, um, a lot of us as marketing teams spend so much time getting that campaign out the door, but we don't actually keep enough time if we don't have a, a digital, a, a, like an analyst or someone to actually go and analyze the results afterwards. We don't keep enough time to do that because once that that campaign's out the door, we're working on the next one to get it out the door. Right. And so then you, I always used to find as a marketer, like I just don't have the time to go and analyze the results and make sure things are aligned properly. And so having that kind of a person as part of an, sort of, whether they are the ops person or that the marketing ops team have got that sort of capability is going to be critical as well in my mind. Yeah. You know, there's something to that. I think one of the things and many of the things you said, not only true, but we can relate to, but the thing that really stood out to me was the idea. I don't have time to go back and look at the stats or to see how that AB test went. I just, I got, I'm busy. The, the marketer today is the digital marketer, the physical marketer, the everything, the marketing automation marketer, um, it, it, in future, the AI marketer, there's so many things we're doing, especially when you're a one man or woman shop, um, you know, holding down the marketing front is that there often isn't time to go look at all that data. And so oftentimes though, it, it's so weird. We spend all the time collecting the data or doing all the extra bells and whistles to have the data be there, but then we don't have the time to go look at it. You know, it's crazy. The other, the other thing that to add to that is, um, the term revenue marketing mm, yep. is 
is not going to be new to anybody. Um, it, it will become part and parcel of a marketing function. So your KPI um, will be that you have to show that you have brought in X amount of revenue, a percentage of the revenue for the business from marketing. Because right. now we, we, you know, marketing just being seen as that cost center yeah. where, you know, when, when businesses go into strife and I saw this, um, I was made uh, redundant in the GFC, um, which is in 2008, uh, GFC crisis. What um, was GFC? Uh, global financial. Oh, 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 the, okay. Yeah. yeah the big the stock big thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 And um, I was working for a global company uh, that was in, in mining and um, the first people that sort of got told, well, we need to cut costs and we, so it was marketing. It's like, no, because in this day and age, that was, that was in 2008, right? In this day and age, I've now got a tool where if I get everything aligned and I've got someone doing the proper analysis or I've got the time to do the proper analysis and I can then put my reporting together to pass it through to, you know, senior management, they can actually see that marketing isn't just a cost center. Right. It's a revenue center. Yeah. And therefore they, they're important to a business. So don't just think when you've got to cut costs, let's cut back on marketing. Um, yeah. In fact, uh, my dad was a marketer himself, um, very successful business. He, he used to, you know, when you're in university, I don't know if you ever heard this approach, but when times are tough, you should be increasing your marketing to, to drive awareness. That. Yeah. And it's quite hard to practice that, right? When, when, is. when money is hard and you, you're like, whoa, we got to spend more money on marketing. But interestingly enough, my dad always lived by that mantra. And, and, and I always watched how they were successfully able to come out of any difficulty. Um, so, yeah, again, if they had a system and they could get their data aligned and they could get their reporting um, spot on, you would be able to prove to the business that actually we're here as a reason. We're not just the people that like to go off and have coffees and long lunches, um, right. you know, <laughs> and are fun and the fun people, right? The ones right. that organize the swag and the <laughs> right. all those things. Right. All the, all the things they think we do, right? Yes. Yes. Um, have you, have you ever seen, there's like a cartoon that, sh that shows like a meme. It says like marketing, um, what my parents think I do. And it has like a picture of them thinking you're like, yeah, at a part at a conference drinking, and then what well, my friends think I do, and it's like you're designing a booth or something. And like everyone thinks you're doing something that's like what I actually do, and it shows me like doing a bunch of reports or something. You know, it's like all these misconceptions of what people think marketing is or isn't. There's just so much, so much variety to that. Absolutely, absolutely. So here's a tough question for you, and and I know you've already wrangled a whole sales and marketing team in an office. And that is going to be easier than this question, maybe. And this question <laughs> is, what is your number one tip for maximizing marketing automation? So yeah, I think I've one. yeah, is keep it simple. Really? To begin Love with. That. And, and how so, so and why so and, and what happens when you don't? Well, if you think about it, a lot of people who who implementing a marketing automation platform may have not had anything in the past. Um, you know, we often there are customers that we might be pulling out of another platform and putting onto a new platform. But uh, but I guess that concept stays the same with both, whether you experience yeah. it or not. Is while you're trying to get used to a new platform and a new system, the more simple you keep it, the more you can understand and learn and understand the way that the system behaves, yep. you then start to push it to its limits and, and, and grow on that. So, you know, in the beginning, unless it's like dire and you've got to get this, this, I don't know, nurture program or something that's really complex out the door because things are really resting on it. Yeah. I, I always say to the customer, let's, let's, let's think about a couple of simple things that we can get done. And, you know, in an implementation for me, I've, I feel I've been successful if I've got the customer to replace at least one form on their website mm -hmm. with a PARDOT form, have got one email out the door, um, doesn't matter, you know, how many people it's gone to and we try and get them to warm their IPs up. So yeah. that's probably a gradual process but an email out the door so that they've had time to play in the email builder. They've had time to see how it all behaves and they can test it. And then, and then a journey built mm, yep. so some kind of a really simple journey. And, and usually those things all kind of align together. Um, 
But the other journey that I find we build frequently and is a journey to help them get um, people to consent <laughs> to receiving their emails. Totally. Because a large part of the customers go, oh, we've got this database and we've never really asked if we could. So it's like, okay, well, you know, you have to by law get people to consent. So let's work through a process of how to, how can we get that done? Do you, do you have GDPR or what, is there a particular Australian law that around email? That we have, have a privacy, we have a privacy policy okay. in place. So it's more around um, privacy and the data sort of privacy policies, um, but not unlike, you know, the Californian law and the GDPR, there isn't something specific in Australia, but, okay. but in saying that, um, you know, GDPR, someone could be living in Australia who, who's got an email that is sort of from a European yeah. or, origin. And so we teach our customers to, to do that GDPR compliance just as a standard. That's smart. Um, it's very smart. Uh, because it's going to have, it's going to come around the world, right? And and this is the thing is, if they're, if it's being, if these kind of things are coming out in different countries, um, so it's going to come through and impact us anyway, or we may have customers from those countries that we're servicing and we don't know that. So we need to just make sure that we've complied um, across both of those sort of rules and regulations as best as we can. Yeah, that's smart. Uh and that's a it's a great point. You never know who you're emailing. You never know where they're from. Or are they in California? Are they in one of those countries in in the EU? Like you have no idea. So just treat everyone the same, and then make sure you're packing value in those emails, and then you don't have to have to worry yep. about it so much. Yeah, that's yep. super smart. Yep. So, so yeah, we, we we have to tell people what we're doing with their data. Um, and so yeah, getting consent and giving them a copy of what you know our our company privacy policy is um, yeah. is is also key in Australia. Smart, smart. Rather than just taking their data and then selling it on the dark web, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what a nightmare. Yeah, like do not recommend that. <laughs> no, <laughs> it probably brings me to one of my pet hates, right? Yes. So how on earth do I get onto someone's email list and then when I want to unsubscribe? they don't acknowledge my unsubscribe. It's like, oh, come on. <laughs> you now, know? now with an email or just with a, a notice on, on the website? What do, what do you no, want email. them to do? Email. No, so um, I, I, you know, sometimes however they've done it, they've, they've elicited my email without me actually opting in. Mm. And, and then when you try and unsubscribe and you keep getting emails from companies, you go, eventually I write them a message and go, hey, I've actually asked you to unsubscribe me five times. Take me off your lists. Um, you know, in this day and age, when you've got a marketing automation platform, that's been built into the platform. You should have no excuses for not doing that properly. Right, right. And yeah, something about being a marketer, sending these emails that when you get a really bad one, you're just like, ugh. So thankfully we have, you know, Google Suite. So I am constantly reporting spam okay, like out of principle true. like like i'm yeah. trying to save the world one spam at a time it's crazy it's brilliant but you yeah, know what I, 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 I would say go ahead no i say i totally agree with you just report them you know one step better um have you received a gdpr opt-out email ever right in the beginning when uh, okay. in that, that date of may when everything was changing i think there was this influx of massive gdpr emails everyone was having to get become compliant yes but um they've, they've slowed down a hell of a lot now i i had um one forwarded to me the kind that says you must like obliterate me from your database you must remove me completely and i think it's a great template for people to use if you're getting spammed thank you for for your email but we're not interested also per u.s data privacy laws and gdpr please remove any and all emails and contacts associated with company name if you do not comply we will be forced to report your activities to the proper authorities which will result in severe fines for you and your company thank you in advance for your cooperation <laughs> great wow. email wowzers and that wasn't even a form someone wrote that one day yeah yikes. awesome response <laughs> yikes so yeah just use that and, and see if you can freak out some companies um, but really people <laughs> What's have that? it as a can, have it as a canned response on your, <laughs> on your tweet, right, and then you just keep sending it out. <laughs> yeah, it, and um, I I interviewed um, I, I have to look up her name, but um, uh, Jody 
Jody, uh, I forget her last name, on the show, and she is like the GDPR queen. So she actually talks with companies about their privacy policies and 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 I learned from her all the different. Oh, it's Daniels, I believe. I learned from her all the different um, steps that companies actually have to take. Um, yeah, Jody Daniels. Yeah. When when you receive a message like that, it's like serious business. And so, just don't, yeah. don't get yourself into it, right? Just yes, sure. avoid it at all costs. Yeah, just, just. Uh, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest hurdles. I'm not sure in your experience is is um, that initial data. And, mm. and what it, you know, custom, that whole data import is, is probably the kind of most tricky thing for most customers because they're bringing data in from multiple places yep. that, you know, the data might be old from certain, pro that they haven't emailed them in a long time. And we keep, we just warn them, we say, you know, if you're bringing dirty data into your system, you've got a great chance that you're going to get you know, loads of bounce rates, which you know, IP perspective is not good oh, yeah. um and you know so we really need to think about the data that you want to bring into your system um before you do so that and again like if you've got other systems where people have opted out let's bring them in and opt them out straight away so you're yeah. not irritating yeah. them yeah so that that whole data Im 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 import is such a big piece of the end of a project Totally. You know, we overlook it too in marketing because it's like, oh God, it's like cleaning your room. Like, oh, can yeah. I'll do my homework so I don't have to clean my room. Um, and, you know, I used to think this too about, about uh, data, data, uh, tomato, tomato, um, yeah. that it was like gold sitting under a dragon. Like, hey, you, your database has 30,000 people in it or 300,000. Yeah, but some of them are from the 70s, you know, or 80s. And I had a company where I, they had, their data carried over like nine different CRMs from the seventies. Oh. They kept it in there. Like, so they, they could say our database is 30,000 people strong. And it's like, no, it's not. It's about 7,000. And you're actually paying whatever service provider you got for the extra 23 and they're not mailable. They're not, oh. they're not. And so it was almost like a safety blanket. Like we felt safer having more, but what I realized talking to the inside view people too, is that that data is constantly degrading. So yep. not only not only is the bad data bad, but the, even the good data may be bad tomorrow. So data is so overlooked, you know. The wow. big topic, a big topic, right? For me, yeah. it's always it's a really controversial topic. And as you say, I might have spent all my time today getting all my data cleaned up, and then suddenly we bring it in, and like you say, tomorrow someone's left a business yeah. that were they were there yesterday, they're no longer there today, their email's been switched off or re redirected or whatever it is yeah it just so, so, so data is um is a big topic i think it'll be a great one to unpack actually <laughs> yeah no seriously um and, and it it would it would turn into a six-hour podcast i think too <laughs> because but like what what's your what's your number one tip on on uh on data yeah for, for me it's um like i think what you were saying earlier casey is be be quite ruthless Mm. In that, you know, don't think that you need to bring everything in. If you can, and I often say to customers, if you've got a, an ability to run your your data through an email verification type of tool, if it's if it's a large database, um, you know, is it not worth the investment of running it through an email verification tool so that you can pick up some of those emails that are just not gonna gonna fly in your in your part out and then have a business strategy of, well, how are we going to deal with those? You know, are we going to just like make a clean that there's too many for us to sit and um, worry about? So we're just going to say, right, they're out. Or are we going to have a, a process in place? Well, that we've got this list now. Do we put an internal calling campaign together where we can call people and just go, you know, and I always say to customers, be very honest with your customers. Mm. Tell them we're busy implementing a new communication tool we want to make sure that we're getting you the right information. So we are just actually updating our database to make sure that we're got all the information right about you. And could we quickly check that your email is correct? Um, and, 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 you know, the more honest you are, the more the customer is going to appreciate that because it, it means that they, you know, that you're not going to batch and blast them. 
if I if I know more about you, I can make sure you write the, on the right list so that I send you specific comms that are yeah. relevant to you. They educate you. They help you become better at your job, um, and therefore people will will respect you. So for me, it's be be a little bit more ruthless um, with the data, um, and like you say. Don't look at it like that. Oh, I've got to clean my room and I'll do everything else that I need to do to clean my room. I know it can slow something down big time. Yeah. Um, but in the end of the day, you know, it's a bit like building the house. You'd rather have the right foundation into your in your house and then build on top of that than to put a dodgy foundation in. And for the rest of time, your house kind of cracks and and doesn't grow, um, doesn't, it doesn't last. Yeah. Yeah, and the quality of the house is not as good. You know, in in some ways, you know, foundation and like 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 the electric electric system, the electricity, the wiring. You know, it's like, do you really want to skimp on that, and then be worried that at any point something could catch on fire? <laughs> like, <flames. laughs> you know, or your your whole side of your house is gonna fall over because you you got a little cheap on the foundation. Yeah, well, we could pour concrete, but. Let's just use goldfish instead, you know, like, no, you're not going to do that. But we do that with our data. It's so crazy. Yeah. Well, who are you, Tammy? I, I know we've, we've chatted a bunch and um, we've got connected. I see you all the time on social, but who are you? Take me back in time, like little Tammy days. Wow. You grew up in South Africa. What's the deal? Did you always know you're going to be in marketing and doing all these kind of things? Well, no. So this is, uh, it's really an interesting, my journey is quite interesting. Um, yeah. So I grew up in South Africa, in Johannesburg, um, have come from a family of a small family, just uh, my brother and my parents and myself. And um, yeah, when I was, I was quite a sporty person. So I've, I've always taken part in lots of different sports um, and academically, you know, I was a good student you know, pass came through with a sort of 65% average or a 70% average, which that's a good student. Um, and just sort of spent my time being very disciplined, um, very focused as an individual. And at about the age of 12, um, I stopped doing ballet. And my mm. mom said to me, you've been doing lots of ballet. I feel like you need to do something else because otherwise you're just going to stop doing quite a, a large part of your sporting activities and we, we, you need to be keeping active. So I loved swimming and I loved dancing and I found the sport synchronized swimming. <laughs> Interesting. And um, started that and, and really enjoyed it. Um, and so much so uh, when I was 18, I represented South Africa in um, some games in Egypt. There was a wow. international competition in Egypt and I went across, it was um, two weeks before I wrote my final, we called it matric, which is your last year of school, okay. high school. Um, it was two weeks before our final exam started and I went over to Egypt to go and compete. Wow. But I think the reason I tell you that story is I think that's the foundation of um, why I've been and become successful is the discipline involved in a sport like that, as much as people laugh at it, um, th what it taught me is team. Teamwork is essential. You can't do a synchronized swimming routine without practice, discipline, and belonging to a team. So those kind of um, skills, life skills, came through with me in, in that experience, um, which then took me down to university. Um, I actually enrolled um, at a university in Stellenbosch, which is the wine country of South Africa. And um, I, I didn't drink wine before that, but I became accustomed to really enjoying wine while I was, I was there. When in Rome, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're exactly. in the wine country, might as well. One of the best in the world, I'd say. Wow. Um, and I've been lucky enough to go to your Napa and Sonoma, and I've done a whole lot of Australian wine countries and some of, some of Europe, and I still rate Stellenbosch um, and Franschhoek as the best yeah so went to university real quick actually, i'm sorry do you do you have a yeah. favorite winery or like if, would you because i don't know anything about it Af african south oh, african wines gosh that is a hard one but there's one in um so where my husband and i got married in a valley in stellenbosch we went back from australia to south africa and um it's it's called um D del air um it's not no it's not del air that's another one um 
gosh, I just the name just lose I lose my mind, but it's in the Frunchuk Valley. Um okay. oh, Graf. It is Dale Graf. Sorry, Dale Graf. It is absolutely beautiful. It the 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 landscape, it's on these big mountains in South Africa. Um and the they've got like amazing every winery in South Africa has got the most amazing restaurants like top top chef restaurants the whole experience about going to a winery we call them wine farms in South Africa is just next level um to anything that I've seen okay and so I found it it's um Delaire Graf estate like you that's it that, that, that's the one you got married there well we got married in that valley um, oh, at a beautiful place called Molen Fleet, um, which is just down from there. So from Delegraph, you can you can see, but the, the power of the mountains that surround you in that area are just next level. Um, oh yeah, that's amazing. Look yeah. at it right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna check out of this podcast and just stare at this thing for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll tell you, if you go to South Africa and you you go down to the Cape, which you would do as part of your journey, you 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 will go back. Because the cuisine, the experience, everything, you just can't get enough. And if I tell you there are hundreds, maybe probably thousands of those kind of wine farms all over that area. Really? Um, it's just phenomenal. Yes. Wow. I mean, I'm looking at the <laughs> I'm looking at the at the stay, dine, wine, spa estate. This is looking pretty nice. So I could see um doing a trip there. Um what what do you is it safe there? What was it like growing up? You hear like crime, but not crime. This is beautiful. Like, is there a problem with crime or? I guess it's like any country in the world, right? Um, okay. Everyone's got some crime. And yeah. unfortunately for South Africa, um, it's probably a little bit more violent um, crime than what, we, what we're used to around the world. But, you know, there's certain parts of Melbourne I would never go to in the, in the nighttime on my own. Um, so for me, I, I personally point? touch touch wood um was never um sort of witness to any any awful crimes and or anything um you know but i have people that i know that have been um you know part of things like that and it's not a great experience by at all yeah uh, but yeah. for me it's, it's about being vigilant right so you always it doesn't matter where you are you still always have to be vigilant so I, I love the country. I didn't come to Australia because I wanted to get away from South Africa. My husband got an opportunity to come and work in Australia. And we thought, oh, we've got no kids, we've got nothing. We, 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 we're not accountable for anything. We don't have to pay a mortgage. Let's go and get some international working experience, um, which we did. And then we really enjoyed it here. And we, 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 we had a child here. And we're like, well, you know what? What a nice place for a child to grow up. Um, we're right at the beach. It's a great, great country. Uh, we really love Melbourne, the culture and the the scenery. You know, again, Melbourne's another place. If you haven't met, visited, you got to put it on your your you list of places. A bunch of things to go to now. Yeah, it's just it's just a, such an awesome city. So that's why we're here. Um, and and as as tourists, we've had lots of um, friends from Australia come back with us on holidays, and just as I say, love it. In in fact, a couple of them have been twice or if they haven't been twice they're planning another trip shortly because well once COVID's finished because they oh, just yeah. loved it so much oh yeah i'm definitely acquiring quite the uh, list of post-covid travel here um <laughs> i'm talking to yeah. really interesting people i have a question for you because it, it um hypothetical because it, it well actually tell me how, how did you get into marketing real quick um yeah so yeah. studied sports science at university mm -hmm. Um, was going to become a teacher and then went over to the UK and did some work there and had the most awful experience in teaching and thought, I mm. do not want to be a teacher. Came back to South Africa and got into a graduate program with one of their biggest um, mobile companies, um, uh, mobile phone companies, and became a field marketer um, in, that, in that space. Very quickly moved, after three years or so, moved into a company that designed and built three-dimensional booths, um, massive booths or big um, car shows and stuff, and started to study marketing part-time um, while I was there and took on a marketing role there. And then, and then I was uh, approached by a client that I worked with on a massive mining show um, 
in South Africa and we built their booth wow. and we designed it and they were launching their brand into South Africa and said, would you come on and be a marketing manager for us? And that's kind of how my life as a marketing manager sort of kicked in is oh, I yeah. then started this whole marketing division for the South African company, which is a global um, brand. And, um, and that, that was the rest was history really. Yeah. Wow. I can see how you just sort of fall into it and then he just, just takes off. That's right. That's right. And if, so it's been a hypothetical long time. for you. Oh no, for sure. Hypothetical question. If you can go back in time, because I might have a time machine here in New Hampshire that, you know, visit post COVID, get some lobster, have a great time. Use the time machine. You get to go back and see yourself and you get to see yourself, um, and kind of pick a different time, but usually it's right about, you just graduated university. Maybe this was before the teaching gig. Um, and you can talk to yourself. What kind of advice would you give yourself knowing all the things you've been through and seen and done? So I would um, just say to myself that your mantra in life is that believe that you can do anything that you put your mind to. Wow. Because that's powerful. If you believe in yourself um, you, you, and you can put your mind to it, I think you can succeed in anything that you try and do. Wow. And that, so, yeah, that sounds unstoppable. Careful. That explains a lot of what, why you're everywhere. I look on LinkedIn and all of these places. Yep. Put your mind to it. Believe yeah, in believe yourself. in yourself and yeah. put your mind to put, Believe that you can put your mind to anything you want to achieve and you will achieve it. Wow. Powerful yeah. words. Where can people connect with you? Where can they connect with you? With Destin? Is Destin, right? Is that the right Destin. way? Destin. Yes, okay. Destin. So um, so my personal LinkedIn is probably my best place um, to get hold of me. And yeah. my LinkedIn profile is is Tammy Begley. Um, yeah. And so my profile link URL is is says um, Tammy Begley, all one word. Okay. Um, and then Destin. Um, Destin is the partner in Australia who started off as a Pardot partner. So we've been implementing Pardot since 2012 or since Salesforce acquired Pardot. Um, we're actually now a what used to a platinum partner. So we're a mm. multi-cloud partner. We've expanded into um, Australia Pacific. So we've got offices in Singapore, Vietnam. Um, we've got an office in Karachi as well in Pakistan. Wow. We service the whole of Australia. So um, we, we've, we've really grown um, over the last, funnily enough, during COVID um, into, into a much bigger organization. And, and we really are passionate about working with organizations who have need some extra help in their marketing, their sales, their service. They, they might need to be transforming themselves or they might just need that extra hand holding um, to get them from one, you know, one step to the next step. Um, and just to make better use of all those functions. So our destined URL is um, www.destined.com.au. Um, and that's where you can find out a little bit more about us as a partner and, and what we do as a business. I love it. Love it. And uh, sounds like that, that virtual onsite is just as powerful as if you were there in person, uh, if not more with the stickies and the, the digital whiteboard. The butcher paper, the digital butcher yeah. paper. Oh, man. Well, go, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to finish off saying where I got the inspiration from as I attended a, as a marketing champion. Um, we, I don't know if you've received them, but you get invites to attend all these awesome soft skill courses. Oh, yeah. And I attended a course about speaking and public speaking. And the lady that ran that course was fantastic because, you know, like yourself, sometimes in virtual sessions, people just switch off. And she just made such amazing use. She was on Zoom. She made such great use of the Zoom features as in, you know, when you, when you, you know, make sure you're collaborating with me. So when you've read something and you finished, use the tick box, the check box um, in the participant section. And so, and if you hadn't done it, she was kind of going, hey, Tammy, have you finished? Are you okay? <laughs> and it was, it was so amazing because it just kept us. And that was like a, probably a four and a half, five hour session wow. on a Friday, Friday afternoon for me. Jeez. And she kept us engaged and working with her for that entire session that um, it was kind of like, this is really cool stuff. Wow. You'd be able to model something. Do you remember her name? 
I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, if you find out, let me know. We'll link to her in the show notes. That sounds like a great person to learn from uh, as well. Yes. Fantastic yes. style. Just to think of the different ways we can keep each other involved and interested in a virtual setting. Yeah. Absolutely. Man. Well, thank you so much for coming on here. This has been such a blast. So great to chat with you. We even worked out the time zones, the different dates. It, now, it's, is it Thursday for you already? Um, I have to think about it. Yes, it's Thursday. Um, is it really? We're, yeah, we're in lockdown. So every day for me feels like the same day. I know. But yes, it's Thursday morning in Australia. We call Thursday Blur's Day now because of COVID. Okay. <laughs> okay. Blur's day. I don't know. It's someday. Okay. Well, it's only Wednesday for me. So what is the future? How is the future? Is it, is it a good day? Is Thursday a good day? Thursday is a fairly busy day for me. So okay. um, I still am trying to educate our son from home. So I have to factor in a couple of hours for a six-year-old oh, to do some online learning, plus fit in all my customer calls and stuff. So it's, it's a pretty busy day for me. All right. Well, it sounds like you're predicting the future for me because tomorrow will be a busy day. That's, that's, that's it. So thank you again for coming on here. This has been a blast. It's been awesome. And so thank you for inviting me. And um, it's lovely to chat to you like this. And we, we must do it more. Agreed. Totally agree. We got to like check in a couple months. We get in the winter months, December, summer for you, perhaps. We're um, going into spring and summer now. Oh, thank my you. gosh. I, I probably should just move there for half the year. Um, for the people listening, if you learned something, and I know you did, because I literally have two pages of notes over here, front and back, then share this episode with someone else on LinkedIn. Um, write down what you, your takeaways were, tag Tammy, tag myself, start a conversation, and we'll reply and join in that with you. That's how you do thought leadership. That's the way to do it. So go ahead and do that. And again, I know I've already said this, Tammy, but thank you again for being on here. It's been a blast. It's been fun. Cool. Thanks. Well, cheers to you and to everyone out there listening. This has been the Hardcore Marketing Show from down under. We will catch you all next time.